Hello, Econ students. It's Professor Kung here, and today we are going to be talking about decision theory. As you can see, I've titled the lesson Decisions, Decisions, and on the image here is a decision problem I'm sure we're all intimately familiar with. Should I study for my test or look at dank memes? I'd be sweating too, but thankfully, I don't have to take tests anymore. Let me start the lesson with a quote by economist Steven Landsberg. He says, most of economics can be summarized in four words. People respond to incentives. The rest is commentary. If you don't know, the word incentive simply means something that would motivate someone to do something. So the quote here is really capturing the spirit of what we're going to be talking about today. Because what Landsberg is saying is that people make decisions based on their motivations, and from the billions of decisions made every day by ordinary people arises the entire economy. So the stuff we'll be talking about today really does serve as the foundation for all of economic analysis. And we'll be encountering fancy words like choice set, preference orderings, opportunity costs. And these are really helpful because they enhance our vocabulary for talking about decision theory in a more precise manner. But keep in mind that decision theory is not meant to be a difficult thing. The best way to think about any decision problem is simply to put yourself in the shoes of the decision maker. We all personally make thousands, if not millions, of decisions every day, so it shouldn't be hard for us to do that. Something else to keep in mind is that economists are primarily interested in the decisions of ordinary people as they go about their daily lives, because it's the decisions of billions of ordinary people that create the economy in which we live. There are other fields of study that might focus on out-of-the-ordinary decision-making or on pathologies, but that's not going to be our focus. Our focus is simply on ordinary people acting according to their ordinary motivations, whatever that means. So here are today's learning objectives. By mastering this lesson, you should be able to 1. Explain how people make decisions using the jargon of decision theory. Like I said, the jargon is really helpful in terms of being precise about what you're saying. 2. Explain the concept of revealed preference and how it is used to learn about people's preferences. I'll explain what that means later. 3. Apply the concept of revealed preference to make inferences about a person's preferences based on their observed choices. 4. Explain the meaning of marginal benefit and marginal cost, and become accustomed to thinking at the margins. And 5. Remember that utility is maximized when marginal benefit equals marginal cost, because we'll be using that concept a lot. All right, let's get going. We'll start by introducing some terminology. When people make decisions, we have to first define the options that they're choosing over. And that's what we call a person's choice set. The choice set is the exhaustive, meaning complete, set of all mutually exclusive, meaning you can only choose one, options that the person is choosing from. All right, let's start with an example. Let's say there's a kid named Henry, and his mom is asking him to choose between an apple, a banana, or a strawberry for a snack. Uh, and he has to choose one of them and only one of them. And so his choice set is simply these three things, apple, banana, or strawberry. Now, knowing the choice set by itself doesn't tell us what Henry is going to choose. In order to know what he's going to choose, we also have to know what he prefers. And so in Henry's mind, he has what's called a preference ordering over the options in his choice set. The preference ordering is simply the decision maker's ranking of the options in their choice set. And so in this example, the preference ordering that we're showing says that Henry prefers the banana to the apple, and he prefers the apple to the strawberry. And finally, maybe this goes without saying, but we assume that people always choose what they most prefer. That seems pretty reasonable, right? And in some ways, it's actually tautological in the sense that if they chose it, then we can, by definition, say that they most preferred it, okay? So people choose what they most prefer. So based on this choice set and Henry's preference ordering over the choices, what is Henry going to choose? 
That's right, he's going to choose the banana. Okay, so that was a very simple choice set with just three options. But choice sets can also be very complicated, depending on the choice that's being made. So for example, let's say that instead of a boy choosing between an apple, a banana, or a strawberry, we have a shopper who's going to a grocery store and has a budget of $100. The shopper can buy any combination of items from the store as long as it's under 100. And so the choice set here is every possible combination of items that can be bought from the store with $100 or less. Now that's going to be a very large and complicated choice set. In fact, the number of unique combination of items that you could choose is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. But we can get even more complicated than that. How about this? When a household is deciding how to allocate their budget every year, they might be deciding between any combination of products or investments that they could purchase with their annual income. That's even more complicated than the grocery store example, uh, but it's a very realistic kind of decision that people make every year. And it's the type of choice set that goes into economists' models of consumer behavior. So as you can see, although the basic idea of decision theory, that people choose what they most prefer out of their choice set, uh, is fairly straightforward, the actual process of making decisions can be quite difficult, and modeling those decisions can be quite complex. Now let's talk about a concept known as opportunity cost. On the right here, we have uh, the choice set and preferences from the example with Henry. Uh, his choice set was apple, banana, or strawberry, and he preferred the banana most, and so he chose it, right? And so the question we're gonna ask is, what was Henry's cost of choosing the banana? Now, if we're talking about the monetary cost, then the cost was zero because his mom gave him the banana for free. But was the banana really free? And I don't mean that in the sense that, oh, well, his mom had to buy it or something like that. I mean that, is it really free from Henry's perspective, right? And for the purpose of this hypothetical question, let's also assume that Henry's completely selfish about it too. Is it still free? The answer is no, the banana wasn't really free. And why not? Because in order to get the banana, Henry had to give up something. And what did he have to give up? He gave up the opportunity to get either the apple or the strawberry. right? And since he would have chosen the apple, then the real cost of getting the banana was giving up the apple. So this illustrates the concept of what's known as opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of something is what you give up in order to get it. And so the opportunity cost of any decision that you make is going to be the value of the best alternative decision that you could have made and said. Let's see if we can put this definition into practice. Here again, I've highlighted Henry's choice set and his preferences. So what's the opportunity cost of choosing the banana? That's right, we already did this one. The opportunity cost of choosing the banana is not getting to choose the apple. All right, how about this? What's the opportunity cost of choosing the apple? All right, the answer is that the opportunity cost is the banana, okay? And if you thought the answer was strawberry, that would be incorrect. Because remember, the definition of opportunity cost is that it's the best alternative option, not the next best option, right? So although the strawberry is indeed next best after the apple, it's not the best alternative to the apple. The best alternative to the apple is the banana, and therefore the banana is the opportunity cost of the apple, okay? And finally, what's the opportunity cost of choosing the strawberry? That's right, it's the banana. So remember, the opportunity cost is defined as the best alternative option. So why is opportunity cost such an important concept? It's one of the first things taught in every single economics course. Opportunity cost is important because it highlights the hidden cost of a lot of decisions, and it can explain a lot of decisions that might not otherwise make sense at first. All right, here's an example. Why do some businesses shut down even though they're turning a profit? A business might shut down despite being profitable 
if the owner could make more money by doing something else. Let's take a coffee shop as an example. Let's say a coffee shop makes $100,000 a year in profit for its owner, who's running the coffee shop by herself. If the owner could instead work for a company that gives her a salary of $120,000, then she might decide to shut the coffee shop down and work for the company. In this case, the opportunity cost of running the coffee shop is the salary the owner could make by working for the company, assuming that that is indeed her best alternative option. The profit that she gets from the coffee shop has to be higher than her opportunity cost in order for her to keep the coffee shop in business. Uh, right, But in reality, of course, the owner might also derive other benefits from running the coffee shop besides the money profits, right? Maybe she enjoys being her own boss, or maybe she really loves coffee. This would then be an additional opportunity cost of choosing to shut the business down, right? Because she would lose out on some of these benefits of running her own business. And let's give one more example. Let's say Staples, the office supply store, is giving student discounts on a variety of office supplies. Why don't you, as a student, go to Staples, buy up a bunch of supplies, and then resell them on a platform like Amazon at a price that's higher than your discounted student price, but lower than the price on Amazon. Then you'd make a profit, wouldn't you? Uh, a pretty uh, easy guaranteed profit. And the answer why most people don't do this is that the price difference, especially after shipping costs, probably doesn't really make it worth your time. Right? The opportunity cost of your time is too high for you to try and make a profit by doing something like this. So here's an example to test our understanding of opportunity costs. If you were to major in economics at your current university, what would the opportunity cost of that be? Is it A, the cost of tuition and books, or B, the value of choosing the best alternative major at your university? or C, the value of choosing the best alternative major at the best alternative university that you got into, or is it D, the value of the best alternative option that you could be doing with your time and money? So the correct answer is D. It's the best alternative thing that you could be doing with your time and money. For some of you, that could actually just be B, choosing a different major at your university. And for some of you, it could be C. Maybe it's to go major in economics at a different university. But for still others, maybe your best alternative option is something completely different. Maybe it's to drop out and start a business. In fact, that's what Bill Gates' opportunity cost of staying enrolled at Harvard was when he dropped out in order to found Microsoft. Uh, and as it turns out, he thought that op the opportunity cost of staying at Harvard was too high. Uh, and guess what? He was right. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying that you should drop out. You are not Bill Gates, probably. Um, but if you do turn out to be, uh, remember me, okay? All right, now let's switch gears a bit and talk about a new concept called utility. Utility is a way to express someone's preferences, uh, just like preference orderings. But instead of simply ranking the options, we're going to give each option a number called utility which represents how desirable that option is to the decision maker. So given a choice set and their utilities over the choices, the decision maker is going to make the choice that gives him or her the highest utility. Let's put that definition into practice. Here's a choice set again, where the choices are apple, banana, or strawberry. Um, this time, instead of giving a preference ordering, I've given the utilities. So the utility of the apple is 5, the utility of the banana is 3, and the utility of the strawberry is 10. So which option will the decision maker choose? That's right, he'll choose the strawberry because it gives him the highest utility of 10. And then second question, what's the opportunity cost of the strawberry? That's right, the opportunity cost of the strawberry is not getting to choose the apple. And in terms of the utility value of the opportunity cost, it's 5. All right, so utility is an abstract numerical value that represents how desirable something is. One thing to keep in mind is that utility doesn't have any natural units, 
All that really matters is how the utility compares to each other. So we could have made the utilities 5,000, 3,000, and 10,000, uh, and the choices would have been the same. Sometimes economists try to express utility in dollar terms uh, in the sense that it's going to represent how much money someone is willing to give up in order to get it. And the nice thing about representing utility in dollar terms is that it puts things in terms that everyone can understand. So our main concept so far is that people make choices according to their preferences. Not a very controversial statement at all. In fact, you could say it's tautological. But it has an important implication. It means that we can learn about a person's preferences by observing their choices. And this is an idea known as revealed preference. Revealed preference is a very important concept in business and economics because it lets us learn about something which we can't observe directly, which is people's preferences, right? People don't walk around with a sign on their head showing everyone what they like and don't like. But we can learn about these hidden preferences uh, from something that we can observe directly, which is people's choices. So here's an example. Let's say that we see a lot more people buying crunchy peanut butter than smooth peanut butter, even at the same prices, then we can infer that more people like crunchy over smooth. And this information could be very useful to a supermarket, which is deciding how much crunchy versus smooth peanut butter to stock. And it could be very useful to a peanut butter manufacturer when deciding how much of each product to produce. Now, an interesting question you might ask is, why not just conduct a survey and ask people directly about what they prefer, crunchy or smooth? Now, surveys have their uses, but there are also some downsides. First, conducting a survey with a large sample size can be quite expensive, and it might be more cost effective to just look at historical sales data for millions of customers instead. Second, it can be difficult to replicate the actual conditions under which real choices are made in a survey. Right? You can ask people in a survey if they prefer crunchy or smooth peanut butter, but survey respondents aren't actually putting any money on the line when they answer, and they also aren't faced with the same choices that they would see on a supermarket shelf either. So while surveys have their uses, uh, oftentimes it's more effective to learn about people's choices, uh, sorry, to learn about people's preferences by looking at their actual choices rather than by asking them what they prefer. Let's now do some examples to put revealed preference to practice. All right, so here's a choice set along with some utilities for a guy named Josh. We don't know Josh's utility for the apple, but we know that his utility for the banana is three and that his utility for the strawberry is eight. And we see that Josh chose the apple. And the question we're asking is, what can we say about Josh's utility for the apple given what we observed? To answer this, all we have to do is remember that people choose whatever gives them the highest utility. And this means that since Josh chose the apple, the apple must have given Josh the highest utility, right? Uh, since the highest utility among the alternative choices is the strawberry at eight, then the utility of the apple has to be greater than eight, right? Because Josh chose it. And so the answer to our question is that the utility of the apple has to be greater than 8. Okay, so let's do another example. This time it's a girl named Stacy. She's facing the same choice set, but her utilities are different. Um, again, we don't know her utility of the apple, but we know that her utility of the banana is 5, and that her utility of the strawberry is 6. Uh, and we observed that she chose the strawberry. And so our question is, what can we say about Stacy's utility for the apple? Again, we just have to remember that people choose what gives them the highest utility. Since Stacy chose the strawberry, the strawberry must have the highest utility. And that means the utility of the apple must be lower than the utility of the strawberry, which is six. So the answer to our question is that Stacy's utility for the apple has to be less than six. Okay, now let's do a more involved example. So in this example, Sarah is deciding what to eat for lunch. Each option she could choose has a benefit, meaning how much Sarah enjoys uh, eating that 
lunch, which we measure in dollar terms, and each option also has a monetary cost. Sarah's utility for each option is simply her benefit minus her cost. And the costs and benefits for each option are shown in the table right here. Um, and let's say we observe that Sarah chose to eat the burrito. And our question is, given these costs and benefits, what can we say about Sarah's benefit of choosing the burrito, which we don't know? So to answer the question, the first thing we want to do is to let the benefit of the burrito be an unknown variable. So let's call it x. So I'm going to replace the question mark here with the letter x. Okay. The next thing to do is we're going to create a new column in the table where we're going to write the utility of each option. So let's create a new column right here. Okay, and then let's fill out the utilities for each option. All right. So the utility of the salad is benefit minus cost, which is 10 minus 6. And so the utility of the salad is 4. The utility of the burger is 12 minus 7, and that's 5. The utility of the pizza is 7 minus 4, and that's 3. And finally, the utility of the burrito, well, we actually don't know what it is, right? Because we don't know what the benefit is but we can write it in terms of the unknown variable x. And so the utility is x minus six, all right? Okay, so the next thing to remember is that since Sarah chose the burrito, the burrito has to have the highest overall utility, right? That means the burrito must have a utility which is greater than the best alternative option. In other words, the opportunity cost. And what's the best alternative? Well, since the burger gives five utility and it's the best alternative, then it's the burger, which means Sarah's utility for the burrito has to be greater than the utility for the burger, which means that x minus six has to be greater than five, all right? And so now to get x, all we have to do is rearrange this inequality. Let's add six to both sides and we get x has to be bigger than 11. And so the answer to our question is that the benefit of the burrito has to be greater than 11. All right, so this is an example of how we can apply the concept of reveal preference to learn about people's preferences from their choices. Okay, so far we've only looked at choice sets which were comprised of distinct options. But sometimes the decision isn't, am I gonna choose this thing or that thing? but rather the decision is how much of something am I going to choose, right? So for example, uh, how many cups of coffee should I drink today? Or if I run a car dealership, how many cars should I keep in my inventory? Or if I run a company that makes microchips, uh, how many microchips should I manufacture this quarter, right? So there are, uh, uh, there are a lot of decisions involving choosing a quantity of something. Now, when people are deciding how much of something to do, they do best by thinking at the margins. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, thinking at the margins means thinking about what to do one unit at a time. Right, so here's an example of marginal thinking uh, using the coffee example. How many cups of coffee should you drink in a day? What you do is you don't worry about uh, immediately thinking about how many coffee cups total that you should drink, you first just go one at a time. Decide whether or not you want to drink the first cup. If the benefit of the first cup is greater than the cost, then you drink it. Then after you drink the first cup, decide whether or not you want to drink the second cup. If the benefit of the second cup is greater than the cost, then drink it. Otherwise, stop drinking, right? Um, so you continue deciding things one at a time until eventually the benefit of the next cup of coffee no longer exceeds the cost of it, right? And that's the point at which you should stop drinking coffee. So to summarize what we mean by thinking at the margins, we mean that you should continue to do more of something until the marginal benefit of doing it one more time becomes lower than the marginal cost of doing it one more time, right? And here, marginal benefit simply means the additional benefit you get from doing it one more time 
and marginal cost simply means the additional cost that you incur by doing it one more time, okay? Let's do an example where we use thinking at the margins to maximize utility. In this example, we have a guy named Winston who is deciding how many cups of coffee to drink. His marginal benefit and marginal cost for each additional cup of coffee is shown in this table. So the way we want to read this table is that the marginal benefit of the first cup of coffee is 10, the marginal benefit of the second cup is 6, the marginal benefit of the third cup is 4, and so on. And similarly for marginal cost. The marginal cost of the first cup is 3, the marginal cost of the second cup is also 3, and so on. In this example, marginal cost is actually the same for every cup, reflecting the fact that Winston can buy as many cups of coffee as he'd like for $3 each. The first question we're going to ask is, how many cups of coffee should Winston drink in order to maximize his utility? Using our principle of thinking at the margin, we would say that Winston should continue drinking coffee until the marginal benefit of the next cup no longer exceeds the marginal cost of it. When does that happen? Well, for the first cup, his marginal benefit is 10, and his marginal cost is 3, so he should drink the first cup. For the second cup, his marginal benefit is 6, and his marginal cost is 3, so he should also drink the second cup. For the third cup, the marginal benefit is 4, and the marginal cost is 3, so he should drink the third cup. But then for the fourth cup, his marginal benefit is 2, and the marginal cost is 3, so the benefit no longer exceeds the cost, so he should not drink the fourth cup, meaning he should stop at 3. And so our marginal analysis tells us that Winston's utility will be maximized by choosing to drink 3 cups of coffee. Now let's fill in the rest of the table so that we can calculate Winston's total benefit, total cost, and total utility for each choice of number of cups that he could make. To do this, we have to understand the relationship between the total and the marginal. To get the total benefit, we simply add up the marginal benefit of each additional cup of coffee. Let me explain. The total benefit when Winston drinks zero cups is zero. If he drinks one cup, the marginal benefit of that cup is 10, which means his total benefit increases by 10. So it goes from zero to 10. Now, if he drinks a second cup, the second cup adds a marginal benefit of six. So his total benefit goes up from 10 to 16. The third cup adds a benefit of four. So his total benefit goes up from 16 to 20. And the fourth cup adds a benefit of two. So his total goes up from 20 to 22. And finally, his total benefit at five cups remains at 22 right, because the additional benefit of the fifth cup was zero. Now let's do the same thing for cost. The marginal cost of each cup is three, so the total cost is going to go up by three for each cup that Winston drinks. So for the first cup, his total cost goes from zero to three. For the second cup, the total cost goes from three to six. For the third cup, the total cost goes from six to nine. For the fourth cup, the total cost goes from 9 to 12. And for the fifth cup, the total cost goes from 12 to 15. And now we're in the position to calculate the overall utility for each choice of number of cups. The total utility is simply the total benefit minus the total cost. So at one cup, the total utility is 10 minus 3, which is 7. Uh, at two cups, the total utility is 16 minus 6, which is 10. At three cups, it's 20 minus 9, which is 11. At four cups, it's 22 minus 12, which is 10. And at five cups, it's 22 minus 15, which is 7. So which choice of cups maximizes total utility? That's right, it's maximized at three cups, which gives us a total utility of 11, which is the highest. And that confirms the answer that we already got using marginal analysis. So the conclusion from our thinking at the margins is that in order to maximize utility, we should keep doing something 
uh, until the marginal benefit of doing it one more time no longer exceeds the marginal cost. And if the thing that we're doing, if the number that we're choosing is divisible, meaning that we can choose fractions of it, we can actually just keep doing it until the marginal benefit equals marginal cost exactly, after which it would become lower, right? And so thus the principle of utility maximization, uh, when the choice being made is a real number, meaning you can choose fractions of it, is that utility is going to be maximized when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. All right, you should definitely re uh, remember this because it's going to come into play quite often in economic analysis. So why does thinking at the margins work? Thinking at the margins works because marginal benefit is usually decreasing as you do more of something and marginal cost is usually rising, right? In other words, marginal benefit starts off high and then goes down as you do more of it, whereas marginal cost usually starts off low and then goes up as you do more of it. And this turns out to be true in most economic applications. Again, let's turn to coffee for an example. The marginal benefit of coffee is probably decreasing for most people because for most people who drink coffee, uh, the first cup of the day might be really important uh, to get you going, right? But then the second, third, fourth, and definitely the fifth cup aren't as uh, important or as enjoyable. And at some point, you might even get outright sick of coffee, in which case having an additional cup might actually become actively detrimental to you and have a negative marginal benefit, right? Uh, similarly, in many applications, marginal cost is increasing, and this is especially true for producers of goods. Again, let's look at coffee for an example. Right? Um, as a coffee farm grows more and more coffee, it has to start using land that isn't as suitable for coffee growth. Right? When it first starts off, it uses the land that's best for coffee, but as the farm expands and tries to grow in more and more, it has to start using land that isn't as well suited. And because of this, the cost to produce the same amount of coffee is going to start to go up as the farmer produces more and more coffee. Because marginal benefit tends to go down and marginal cost tends to go up as you do more of things, the overall marginal utility tends to go down as you do more of something. And the idea that marginal utility is usually decreasing is known as the law of diminishing returns. It's an important concept in economics because it can explain um, a lot of things that we see. For example, it can explain why people have a taste for variety. People like to purchase a variety of different things because as they consume more and more of one thing, let's say hamburgers, they start to enjoy it less and less. And so other things start to look more attractive, like pizza, right? Diminishing returns can also explain why firms require higher prices in order to produce more goods, because their marginal costs are going up as they produce more, and so they require higher prices in order to compensate them for increasing production. It can also explain why young industries tend to grow faster than mature ones. In a young industry, firms can seize on the lowest hanging fruit and the best available opportunities early, but as the industry matures and the low-hanging fruit is all taken, it becomes progressively more difficult to find good opportunities. Okay, so that's all for today's lesson. I thank you for sticking around and I hope you enjoyed it. Most importantly, I hope you learned something that will stick with you, and I hope that our study of decision theory will help you with your own decision making as well as help you to better understand the decisions of others. Until next time.